like that guy goes, yeah, in the background. Y'all got cocaine eyes. I don't. Not anymore. Thank you very much. That's a good line from the song. Y'all got cocaine eyes. Mick Jagger. It's the Jeff Dubay podcast. I know we're on the air. I'm not just yeah, stupid. What? Cocaine eyes. Ah, oh, it's coming up. It's coming up. I don't know. If, do we have does the song play long enough? Ah, it's all right. I don't want to get you in trouble with that. <laughs> come on, come on. Cocaine eyes. Get to the line. We got sixty. Y'all, here it is. Going. Here it is. Cocaine eyes. You got cocaine. I used to have cocaine eyes. I don't anymore, and I'm very, very grateful that I do not. Look at that. Clear as a bell. What do you think, Brandon Warren? Take a look. It looks fantastic clear clear eyes. here. Yeah, clear, it looks great. Clear eyes. Well, don't stay. Keep your distance there, pal. But, <laughs> but, but I appreciate the endorsement. Yeah. Brandon Warren is the guest today. We're talking some baseball. We're going to talk some twins. We're going to talk some World Series. We're going to talk manager search. Uh, Brandon uh, was uh, was writing twins, following twins on the twins beat for 1,500. When I was uh, when I was at 1,500 last year. That's how Brandon and I how Brandon and I met. Brandon, take a look over your right shoulder for me, please. <laughs> Oh, so anyway, the most mature podcast <laughs> in the world. <laughs> it's pathetic. I'm not proud. I'm not but proud. I feel bad for the people that aren't here that don't get the, the know, little inside jokes on the uh, <coughs> visuals around here. I know. Um, or, excuse me. Anyway. Awesome. Yes. Uh, so anyway, anyway, back uh, back on point. Back, were we ever on point? Were we ever <laughs> on point? We are going to talk baseball with the great baseball mind, Brandon Warren. And Brandon is, uh, I'm not saying this to make fun of you. I'm saying this because it's good to have somebody who's not exactly like me. You, 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 you do like to dive into some numbers and some st- st- statistical analysis. You can tell us the validity uh, of, of, of war and what war means and what is it good for. And I say absolutely nothing, but it's up to, it's, you got the opposing viewpoint on this, and we'll get into that. Yeah, in some respects, and I, we'll dive into that. That'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, Brandon is uh, somebody, he's not Phil Mackey-like in his love of sabermetrics. And I love Phil Mackey. I don't mean that, to, that, that is a shot. Phil's a friend and, a, and somebody who I respect as a, as a journalist and baseball mind. But he is somebody who really, really, really is very number-centric. I just genuinely love the game of baseball, and so I've kind of come yeah. full circle from Numbers, numbers, numbers. Too. There's a lot of things that numbers don't tell you. Well, but you know what? There, but there is there is room for advanced statistical analysis at the same time. I mean, still, yeah. Batting average. I, I will admit this much. Batting average, home runs, RBIs doesn't tell the story. You do need a. You need, if you're if you're a baseball guy, if you're like a a GM or a, or, a, or a scout or whatever, you do have to go a little deeper than that. Well, let's put it this way: batting average tells you that every single hit is exactly the same, and we know that's not true. Correct. That is that is correct. That, that, but that's why they play 162 because it it, you know, it evens out. Junior Ortiz, it was funny in 1991. You know, Junior Ortiz was a backup catcher for the Twins, and uh, you know he's, he was Scott Erickson's designated catcher, and you know he's brought on to be a defensive guy and uh, and just just kind of you know catch every you know day game you know just to give Brian Harper a rest that kind of a thing, and he was hitting 400 in June. And he didn't hit a ball hard. I mean, he he hit more bleeders and flares and just little crap off the hands, little duck farts into right center. I mean, he he he, he the guy couldn't hit the ball squarely, uh, you know, on the barrel of the bat if, if, if for to save his life. And he was hitting 400 in June, and they started calling him Ted. He was Ted Williams. He, the, his nickname in the locker room was Ted. It's funny you bring him up. I was actually looking at him recently because people were talking about how good Brian Harper was when he was. He was a pretty good hitter, and he Frank could hit. He was like 29, and and was awful before he was with the Twins, and uh, Ortiz had a really nice year in 91. Yeah, he really did. He really did. And not to mention, Junior Ortiz, one of the all-time great clubhouse guys. Just a riot. Just a, I mean, he, his, his eyes are always as wide open as like a guy on a five-day meth bin. I mean, <laughs> I mean, he's just like this, just bug-eyed, and he, and he stuttered. So he's just like this. He did, he did, he's just like, he did. he's kind of like me, really, when you think about it. <laughs> you need those glue was, guys. He, but he was really, he was, and we don't mean sniffing glue guys. We just mean a guy who, <laughs> who's a bonder in the clubhouse. I mean, he, he was a guy who really kept it loose and, uh, and just a great clubhouse addition, a fantastic guy, and the Twins were lucky to have him. I'm Jeff Dubay. Jason McGovern is the producer and slash sidekick. Brandon Warren is the guest, and we're going to talk baseball. But, you know, sometimes inspiration strikes in, in, in weird places and in weird ways. And as I was walking into Devil's Advocate today, and let me, let me pimp Devil's Advocate for a second, because damn right this is where it all started, and we're, uh, we're proud to call our home every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or at least uh, as much as we can do, Monday, Tuesdays. Uh, five o'clock, uh, we are, we're here, and uh, we're here for happy hour. Uh, and they have a fantastic happy hour because it features 40 craft beers. Jason McGovern is a beer snob. I'm a semi-retired beer snob. I'll have a beer once in a while. I mean, I'm in recovery, but I can have a... Remember when Brett Favre had the Vicodin thing? Then he came out and said, I have a beer once in a while. And, like, the world was outraged at him. It's That's just, ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Uh, you know, you've seen me sit here and have a beer. And uh, guess what? I didn't wake up two weeks later in a Super 8 in Des Moines with an eight ball and a crack whore. I mean, it's just, <laughs> you just, it doesn't have you to be... made it through it. It doesn't have to be that way. You can have a beer and you can go home and go to bed. It's kind of the way I've always rolled. But uh, you are a current beer snob. I'm a semi-retired beer snob. Forty craft beers. I mean, you're not going to come in here 
and get a Bud Light on tap. No, you, and you I haven't a had a bad beer yet no. since I've been in here. You, you actually can't get a bad beer on tap here. They're no. all really good. And I'm drinking the Crazy really Mountain, which is the other special right now, right? So, yeah. So if you're somebody who likes, if you're somebody who likes microbrews, uh, I mean, they've got 40 from around the country here. I mean, they basically are a collector of microbrews. Are you a beer drinker, Brandon? Yeah, I like a little bit of everything. I'll, I'll change it up here now. You and look then. like a Bud Light drinker to me. No way. You know, <laughs> that's mean. That's mean. Uh, well, yeah. you're a kid. You're a kid. That's true. That's right. I'll try anything though once. Uh, you know, I'm not a big IPA fan. I kind of like the pilsners and the wheats, but sure. I'll try anything. It's starting to get into the darks a little bit. The surly stuff is it's a lot of fun. There you go. There you go. Yep. So you're, you're making the transition. I mean, I was talking to a bartender about this uh, just a, a couple nights ago. I was out with a buddy of mine uptown, and uh, we're talking about how I mean, when when you start. You know your your beer drinking career. You know in the, your late teens, early twenties. Career, uh, like you get paid well, for it. You know what I'm talking about. I do. And and it all starts for people with the, with the Mick Golden Lights of the world. I mean it really does. Oh, yeah. Or the old Milwaukee. If you're cheap or you know broke or a high school kid, the old Milwaukee's of the world, the Natty Lights of the world, that yeah. kind of stuff. I always call it shit beer. Yeah, exactly, gives exactly. Me a lot of endorsements. And uh, what happens at some point is you start to phase out of it. And my first transition beer was Killian's Red. That was the first thing that got me out of like... A lot of my friends were... That was the same for them. Yeah. 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 Amstel I'm, Light even. Well, there's a couple of people drinking that okay. kind of I stuff. I mean, if you like Heine... I think Heine's a little skunky, but Amstel Light is Heineken Light, basically. Right. I mean, it's the same brewery. Uh, and it's basically the same beer. Uh, and I can drink it. I can drink either of those. Um, but uh, to me, it was it was a Killian's Red... And then to Sam Adams, and and then to Newcastle. Cause Newcastle for a dark beer is the smoothest, easiest. Thing. Oh yeah, for a brown, it's, it's, it's a, one it's of the simplest browns. In you the ever world. have a Newcastle brown? Oh yeah, they're great. Liney's, they Liney's Honey Vice was my transitional. There's a good transition. That's, you know, I'll tell you right now. I mean, I know that they do some berry beers and stuff that are kind of for chicks, but I can drink anything Liney's. I can drink anything. I mean, seriously, Liney, that's a, you can't find a bad Liney's, and I'm not kidding about that. Really? You like you don't well, like Liney's? Well, no, 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 I'm not anti Liney's, Liney's, but I just I don't. I, feel I would like not I've grown. get a berry vice. I would not get a berry vice. That's really chick. That's a chick beer. If you're over 23 and not female, you can't. Well, order what a about berry if you're vice. like uh, up north or you're in Cedar well, you, you Falls can do or the berry, something? The honey berry, where you mix the half half. That's the only way. You can oh, I wouldn't do honey and still berry. consider yourself. I like, I like honey. I like. I mean, they they do. A Northwoods Lager. That's a thick, dark. Oh yeah. I mean, they got some stuff. They oh, they have a they have a ton of beers. You'd yeah. be surprised. But anyway, yeah. Uh, but I went I went from that. I went from Liney's, uh, not Liney's. I went from Killian's Red, like into some Liney stuff, into Sam Adams, into Newcastle, into Summit, and stuff, into Summit EPA. I mean, so there's something. I, I I think Summit roofies all their beers because they. I, I mean, Summit. You just talked about that last Summit night. How you get more messed up su- off Summit? People get messed. I mean, I've, myself included, and I've seen other people get more messed up on Summit EPA. I, and it's only if it's five point five, so it's strong, but it's not outrageously strong. No, and it's. And but I mean, people. I, I see people have like three, four, five summit summit EPAs, and like start dancing on rooftops. Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, then you're right about the roofie thing because you shouldn't be able to drink three or four of those and, and be that you. affected. It's it's a it's it's a it's a it's a it's a potent brew. But Some, anyway, something in the water. It is. A t- there's Tony. Uh, What's up, Tony? This oh, city. Tony. Ah, the Tony. No Tony. Love. Tony's a bartender here. He just gave me no love at all, but. What's up, Tony? Great basketball mind. He just okay. That's the last time I try that. <laughs> he he's can't a nobody. Hear that at all. Tony, uh, I'm gonna and get, he's working. I'm gonna give people a quick preview here uh, before we get into this show. Uh, Tony's gonna be on the show a week from today because Tony is a is a, he runs a basketball scouting service. Uh, so he's like he's like into the AAU scene and the high school scene. I mean, he's kind of like Henry Lake to be honest with you. Remember Henry Lake? Yeah. Oh yeah. He's in Kansas City now. Great guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and and Tony basically kind of does what Henry Lake did. I mean, like real grassroots and he's. He's, uh, I mean, he's told me some, you know, some very revealing things about the AAU scene and how sleazy it is and how college coaches go right to AAU coaches and these AAU coaches will, will use their influence to steer kids to colleges while they're getting benefits from some of these college coaches. It's very sleazy. It's going to be very expose-like next Tuesday, so buckle up. That's it's awesome. Gonna, it's going to be very 60 Minutes-like on this, on this show. I'll be more Should than safer the, and you be the, the serious chair. music? Uh, yeah, maybe, do it, do it. Maybe do the it. clock tick? Yeah, the clock Some tick. law and order. Uh, speaking of the clock tick, uh, that's, let's talk, I want to talk about something that, uh, that I saw coming in. Uh, there's a billboard about a block from here, uh, at, uh, from Devil's Advocate. We're at 10th and Marquette, uh, around the corner from the local. And the sign, the billboard on the rooftop that I saw, was for the Minnesota History Center, or the t- Historical Center, whatever the hell it is. That's Minnesota History Center, I believe. I think that, that's, that's correct. It's a, it's a museum that's about, what, it, it opened in the 90s. Yep. And it's right it's, off it's, 94. Yeah, there. Right, right across the highway from the Capitol, mm-hmm. is, is it not? Correct. And it is. It's 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 a nice little museum. It's a it's, it's fluffy. I mean, it's not. You're not going to go there and, and see you know Remoir or, or Van Gogh. Or, no, but they they put some cool exhibits in there. Yeah, it is. It's, it's it's about the, the history baseball of hall of fame went through there. That was oh, cool. did it really? Yeah. I mean, and they and they do things that are specific uh, if they can to, to, to just kind of life in Minnesota and growing up in Minnesota or whatever. It's the Minnesota History Center. Duh. <laughs> but so what they did, what they're what they're doing now, according to the billboard that I saw is they're uh, doing vintage toys of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, which is, you know, I grew up, I was a child of the 70s. I grew up in, I was born in 68, so I was a kid through the 70s and into the 80s. 
And it just got me thinking to, 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 to what some of the cool things and some of the not so cool things were that uh, I was going to say that I was playing with when I was a kid. Now, let's, let's leave that one alone, everybody, just for a second. Just, but in, in all honesty, I mean, right away I had this, 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 this flood of, of, of Rock'em Sock'em Robots memories. I mean, you know Rock'em Sock'em Robots? I definitely remember Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Although, the, and how did we think of, that was the best? I know, it was. The time, we <laughs> well, but, and why did they even have ropes? Because they couldn't go far enough back to actually get on the ropes. No. But, uh, I mean, and, and one of the guys always had a glass jaw. I mean, I don't remember if it was the red guy or the blue guy on my set, but one of them, re- you could breathe you'd heavy. Tap him. Then yep, it would you'd go. tap him, he'd go. And the other guy just was in there just like an anvil, and you couldn't pop him if you had you your own fight fist. over who gets the blue oh, guy absolutely. Whole, every time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, but I mean, I had a couple of other more obscure. Um, uh, well, I'll say more obscure. Let's, let's, let's not go right to the more obscure. Either of you guys ever have any of the super jock guys? Like the, the, the football guy who pound him on the head and he kicks field goals like from across the living room? I saw him. I never oh, had I think I remember that one. You didn't have that? No. Oh, it's the best. I mean, it's just this little, he was a, like a roided up kicker. He just kind of stands there like with a square jaw and big shoulders and, you, and, 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 and a real long pencil neck because you pound on his head and his right leg, you know, kicks a plastic football. I mean, like, from me to Emily, Emily's the bartender there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I could, I could 20 kick, feet? Yeah, you could kick field goals at least this far. I mean, it would just launch. It's the old school way kickers used to, like, Tom Dempsey just stand there yeah, and yeah. swing their and leg then, up. And you know what? This guy might have been modeled after Tom Dempsey because he had, like, a half foot. He had, like, a sawed-off oh, foot no. with a flat toe. Oh, no. Oh, I'm telling you, it was, it was the coolest. But then they made, like, Super Jock basketball and hockey and soccer, you know, where you, know, you could shoot a puck, kick a ball, whatever. Uh, the baseball was a little tricky, but uh, nonetheless, the whole Super Jock series was kind of cool. But how about some slightly more obscure things? Like, I had an Evil Knievel set like, where, where you took this, you had an Evil Knievel doll, action figure. I didn't play with dolls. I was going to say, he was, doll, an, huh? it was an action figure. And you put him on the motorcycle, and you put him on this little red ramp with a, with a, with a crank, and you sit there and turn the crank to, you know, to get the motor revved up. Then you had a button that would release the motorcycle, and you'd go flying across the room. And it came with an RV, an Evil Knievel RV. And you could put like a ramp on the RV, and he would hit the ramp, and he would just go, he would just go airborne. I mean, he could fly about as far as the football <laughs> and that, uh, from Super Toe Football. So, so, so and would the, he crash, or oh, did he, he actually land? You no, know, he had brutal crashes. I mean, he'd hit the <laughs> so wall. So realistic. Oh, you scare the hell out of the pets, too. I, it, it was in, just awesome. in retrospect, it almost sounds like a toy they'd have on Saturday Night Live when Dan Aykroyd would like bag of glass. Yeah. All these, all these unsafe, yeah, 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 unsafe yeah. toys that these kids had 30 years yeah, and ago. Didn't, 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 and that bit, didn't they have something that his head lit up like a lighter? Yeah. I, can't, I can't remember what that is. <laughs> it was just the worst toy. things you could imagine. Yeah, it was funny. And, but I'll tell you, speaking of bad toys, no, no parent ever should have ever bought or forced their kids to play Perfection. Do you remember Perfection? Yeah, I mean, Awful. You had, you, had this, it, you had this platform that had holes in it, and you had these and specially uh, shaped plastic pieces that corresponded to each specific hole, and you had to press the, you press the game board down, and it started ticking like a goddamn bomb. I mean, like, like, if you're you're an eight year old kid and you are becoming the most, you're on your way to becoming a neurotic adult. Thank you, mom. Thank you, dad. Yeah, that's where you get your anxiety. Yeah, seriously. That's where we all get I mean, it. This, thing, this thing's going tick, 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 and you're trying to put these little pieces. It's like you're trying to defuse a fucking bomb, and it's about to go off in your face. You're about to get, you're about to eat a bunch of plastic pieces for lunch that are going to hit you projectile into your face at like 70 miles an hour. And you're just like, and you're hearing the tick, 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 and you're just like, I mean, you're freaking the fuck out. And you're trying to get everything put into the right slot. And then sure enough, you got like one piece to go. And before you can hit, you know, the plunger saying, I've done it, I've won. The, the thing explodes in your face. And you've got like jagged, pl- j- just jagged shards of plastic just r- r- rushing through, the, you know, the two feet between you and the game board. And just sticking in your face. And you're just like, you can't even have time to close your fucking eye. And you're just like, God damn. And you, you're pulling pieces out of every you know, out of your nose. And it, 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 made, it turned me into a neurotic adult. I mean, it's just, it's like you're trying to defuse a bomb. It, it, were your and the parents, clock is ticking. You hear the tick, tick, tick in your goddamn sleep. Are, are the adults in the room just watching this and going, ha, 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 you yes. fucker, deal yes. with what I deal with every day well, it's like They it's deal a, with pressure in life. You know, seriously, it's, that's exactly what I it think was. They, they'd like, and the guy who invented that game, that's what he was thinking. Well, speaking, of, invent. speaking of guys who invented games, Brandon, you, you were you're talking about Operation earlier. Yeah, we were talking about Operation. Is reading the news the last couple of days, it sounds like that guy's actually trying to gather up some cash so he can have a real-life operation. I don't know if that's funny or sad. That's just like the worst irony you could even imagine. The guy who invented Operation needs an operation. He's got to have his funny bone removed, apparently. Water or, on the knee. Water on the knee. <laughs> those are the only two I can remember. Uh, or was, uh, those are the only two I can remember. Spare rib. Maybe you guys get a spare rib. Yeah, remember. right. But there's spare rib. There's rib. Yep, there's a rib. <laughs> but, but so, so, so the guy who invented that game not only needs an operation, but he's 
he's he's he's he's financially challenged enough that he's raising money to have. How an is operation. that possible when you sell that many millions of those things that you're not just loaded forever? What is, forever. If Sprewell's broke, anybody can be broke. What? Are, what? Why well, he had to feed his family? What are the chances <laughs> that that he winds up on the operating table with some real smart ass surgeon who oh. puts a red like a red big red light on his nose and and like fucks up and goes. Eh. <laughs> Goes, you did it to the, the other kid, ever. you asshole. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting you back, you son of a bitch. I got your spare rib. <laughs> well, considering how old the, uh, <laughs> the doctors should be, they probably played that game when they were kids. It's, oh, it's awful all the way around. That would be great. That would just be great. But well, how many of them have had a flashback when they're right. actually exactly. you know, going they're that age? You know, they're in there and they're doing you know open heart surgery, and all of a sudden, ah, a little twitch, or they hear you that buzzer. You know what the worst toy ever was? Well, no, there's two. I got two really, really bad A lot bad of bad ones. toys. Did you ever have Kerbangers, I think they were called? Basically, it was like a, looked like a martial arts weapon. It's like a, a, a tiny little plastic handle. It's maybe two or three inches long. And it had two ropes, two strings coming out of it. They were probably about uh, uh, ten inches long with really, like, hard, hard ceramic. Not ceramic, but, like, hard, hard, hard plastic balls on the end. And, and you'd, like, raise your arm up and down, and they'd, they'd make a circle. They'd oh, hit yeah. at the bottom, they'd I hit totally the top. They'd hit the bottom. You'd get them at the circus and, or and something you, like that. And once you get it going in a good, you get a good rhythm, bang, 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 bang. Now you're fucked. Now you're, like, <laughs> now you're like, come take this away from me because as soon as I try to stop, it's going to hit me right in the wrist bone. I'm going to take one right in the hamate, and I'm going to go on the DL. I'm going to go on the toy DL for the next You'll three months. You'll be wrecked. You'll be wrecked. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they are hard. I mean, they're hard as golf balls, and they are moving. And if you, it's like once you really got them going, you either, you're either going to screw it up eventually where they're not going to make solid contact, and then they're going to go, you know, they're going to go askew and hit you right in that damn bone right in the top of your wrist, or else you're going to just have to try to drop it and, like, one, like walk away fast. Like, drop it and, like, withdraw your hand. Before it breaks your wrist. Like a grenade. Who the hell invented these things? They're a martial arts weapon. Too many of you They're kids obviously did get hurt by those because they eventually perfected them and made them just a, on a plastic rod well, they, where the they ball, should've. they couldn't go anywhere else other than where they had oh. to go to hit oh, each other. Oh, that makes sense. You know what I'm saying? They, yes, that makes sense. They and, got rid of the they, yeah, they, yeah, they made it Thank so it wasn't God. no longer dangerous. Thank God. But it also kind of took away from, you know, this, like you were being punished if you screwed up oh. with that thing, which was kind of, you know, good. I'm going to give you another one. And this was a popular toy that is, as far as I know, not dangerous. But who the fuck ever had a moment of enjoyment with a Rubik's Cube? The only people who ever solved them are the people who bought the goddamn book and read the step-by-step. -step. And how do you feel good about yourself? I mean, seriously. Or they took the stickers off? Or took the stickers oh, off. Those. They either took the stickers off or they, or they read the book, How to Solve a Rubik's Cube, and read it, you know, step-by-step. -step. I mean, did anybody ever just sit down with a Rubik's Cube and go, no, no, no. hey, did it. I now mean, what? I mean, that's, well, well, then, then what? Yeah, then now what? what? Yeah, how do you mess it up badly enough to ever get any use out of it again? I mean, it's a disposable toy. It's a one-time use. What's the use? But I mean, it's it's how's it any fun? It, the point of having a toy is recreation. Not you don't want to think. It's you don't genius. Wanna solve. Though. Parents give it to you and oh, you don't do any, you don't say anything for hours. That's it's genius. That's what it was. Well, yes, yeah. it was throw this kid in a room and make him shut up. It was parent driven. There's no oh, yeah. doubt it was parent driven. Oh, yeah. But I mean, I, I guess I didn't mind Simon, and Simon made you think a little bit. You know, Simon the, was fun. The four flashing lights, and you had to do the pattern and then yeah. repeat the pattern. I mean, I was I was fairly good at that, but. The um, I, I just I, I can't imagine how anybody ever had a moment's enjoyment with a Rubik's cube. I just it just doesn't make sense to me. No, but I, I like your point though. It's, it's to shut the kid up. It's perfect. It's like give, it's like today you couldn't give a kid a football and, and they'd stay away from it. They'll come something. back in and, and need to play a video game. Well, Brandon Warren is only 28 years old, so I'm guessing your oh, first so toy was a Sega Genesis. Well, for me, uh, the C and say or like a. Oh, the like, speak and spell? Like, yeah, like speak and spell, like the nerdiest toy you yeah, get. E.T. I'm just sitting there like... You and E.T., dude. Yeah, man. So, so like, now uh, spelling is kind of my thing. It's no big deal. Like, I can spell anything. But uh, we also had Connect 4 and Operation. You Do know, you need a glass of water? Oh, you got one. I'm sorry. I, think we're, I think we're pretty good. I think I we're good. good. Yeah, so he's... Sam, we're good. It's like Jason's the toys, idiot. The, <laughs> anyway, continue. I had, like, the nerdiest toys. And then, <laughs> otherwise, we'd go out in the yard, knock yourself out with your brother's... Play baseball. We lived in a trailer court with, uh, you know, we never had a lot of money, so we lived. We played baseball. If you hit the ball over the trailer across from me, it's a home run. Okay. Well, we, I, we all kinds of I wanted to ask Perfect. Jason. Oh, you know, I love the wiffle ball bats that were like really like big giant. They look like caveman clubs. You yeah. Just hit the ball. Yes. But I'd, I'd like to ask Jason about his toys. But he has the kind of toys that you have to purell before you use them. You know what I'm saying? After after each use. Well, that's I a, haven't got my soundboard up yet. My, I'll have a rim shot. That's for my favorite. It's one of my favorite lines from uh, "Get Him to the Greek." Have you guys seen "Get Him to the Greek"? I actually have. I have seen that I once, so I don't love, remember the line. I mean, I'm a, I think I'm the only person in the world who legitimately loves "Get Him to the Greek." I mean, you know, Jonah Hill and uh, and, and Russell Brand. Yeah. And, and Russell Brand is Al, you know Aldous Snow, the same character he played in "Forgetting Sarah Marshall," and it's just and he's, he's just a, he's just a drug addled idiot. That, uh, that 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 Jonah Hill's trying to you know get across the country to get to get him to show up at his concert at the Greek Theater, and it, there's just there's just so many hilarious moments. But at, at one point, he he tells his groupie to take Jonah Hill into the bedroom and, and just do him, 
and she, she, she takes out this gigantic dildo and sticks it in Jonah Hill's face and goes, when's the last time you pureled this thing? <laughs> it's just one of the best lines, oh, one man. of the best lines ever. <laughs> so like that, so anyway, Jason's toys are the type that need to be pureled, so we're not going to get into his toy chest. I was really hoping to get to that, too. No, seriously. Go, no. Give, no. Well, no, you know what comes, to my mind? Childhood. what comes to my mind right now is the evolution of the Nerf football mm -hmm. that we watched. Yes. You went from that terrible, just sponge oh, that the, it's the a ball killed it. wet at I, all. Yeah, it was ruined. Yeah, but and then you got the one that where you could throw it a mile. Yes, because it it's like it. half plastic. It's yeah. like robo football. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's awesome. And, and, and you could, I mean, you literally could say, just uh, put a guy on a go route at any time and throw it 60 yards. You know, I think that's 12 years old. With the tails, too, that whistle and make all that funny noise. Yeah, well, those came a little Did you guys have an Itza ball? Itza balls are the bomb. Well, is that one again? You It's a Nerf. It's like a Nerf ball, but you inflate it. And you can pump it up to ridiculous proportions if you wanted to. I don't think Very stretchy, bouncy rubber. You know what? It's probably toxic and and, and, <laughs> and outlawed by the time you were a kid. Probably. So, I mean, I'm 46, so you're 12 years younger. By then, they that may have... lawn darts went out around the same time. Yeah, probably. well, once you get uh, you know, a couple guys in the temple, it's pretty much over for lawn darts. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard at that point. Which I did play as a child, though. Lawn darts? Yep. Well, you oh, had yeah. with, really, the metal, you, you with the metal ones. Well, you oh, yeah. Had, you oh, yeah. Had, you, your parents were either really, really shitty or really cool. <laughs> or maybe just <laughs> doped up. That's like a combination. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Most most cool parents are really shitty parents. Right. I mean, it's, right. A, it is a line. There's a line. Well, Brandon is a great baseball mind. I, like I said, I met Brandon uh, last year. I was working at 1500. He was writing, covering the Twins for 1500. Uh, and uh, and uh, he has uh, got his finger on the, on the pulse of the manager situation. He's been watching the World Series closely. Uh, but to go, I want you to go ahead and plug uh, plug away where you're working and where people can read your stuff. Well, so I'm with Sports Data is my day job. You know, we're doing college football. And so NCAA.com is where all our previews and recaps go. It's kind of a Turner-based thing. I still write for Fangraphs a little bit. Write for my personal website, BrandonWarren.com. And, and beyond that, I'm just always looking for doing audio things and all that kind of stuff. So uh, Twitter... At Brandon underscore Warren. I'm on there pretty much nonstop, which is kind of my thing. But uh, just always thinking about baseball, always working on baseball stuff, too. Hey, by the way, a mutual friend of ours and a guy who's been on the show, Ross Brendel. Right. Or Br I don't know. Is it Brendel or Brendel? What? I don't care. Ross. I think it's Brendel. Uh, whatever, Ross. If you're listening, I don't give a shit how you pronounce your last name. I just call you Ross. Uh, but the most enthusiastic broadcaster I've ever met in my life. I was joking around with him when he's on the show. That he's the guy at the beginning of Platoon getting off the helicopter in Vietnam all opie like and, and, and that guys like us who've been through the re, uh, radio meat grinders, the three of us, we're like the guys who are like, we're like, we're waving our arms around each other's shoulders, limping to get on the helicopter. We're like we're, a band of brothers. We're bloody, yeah, we're bloodied and beaten. But, but Ross, Ross just gets off the helicopter. No, I'm in Vietnam. I'm happy to be here. We're hey, all let's there. Let's do a sports update. That's, that's Ross. He's the opie of Twin Cities Radio. Uh, and I love him to death. And he just called to say the operation guy. Sold the rights to his game for five hundred dollars and no longer gets anything for it. Oh, what, what an idiot! Oh, he, he no longer somebody, deserves anything. Yeah, somebody somebody operation. clearly removed his brain bone back in the day. I mean, that's, that's that's ridiculous. Operation guy, you're an idiot. You're, and you get what you deserve if you're that dumb. He has been looking at his bank statement for the, his entire life, oh, going, same. "What did I?" Yeah, do? kind of like how I Google myself and do the same thing. <laughs> It's, it's, it's really, it's not that far off. It's not that far off. Uh, or, or Wikipedia myself. Yeah, yeah. It, once you, once you guys get a Wikipedia page, then you come talk to me. I've, I've, I mean, I got a Wikipedia page. All right. That's, that's how you arrived. That's, that, is, that is it. Or, or maybe how you exited. I mean, that's, it's one or the other. One or the other. But anyway, uh, let's talk Twins manager. How close? I mean, it's going to happen this week, is it not? I mean, and it's and it's 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 down really to Molitor. Or, it's down to Mahler and, and, and Lavello. And, and I'm not such. Why am I not a big Lavello guy? Make it make a case for Lavello to me. And why well, is it Lavello and not Lavello when it's a U in the middle of his name and not an E? And tell him I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, make I, sure you pass that along. I think he's Italian American. I think it could be that. But oh, I, they don't say anything. They don't say anything. <laughs> I'm he, fine with it. He's, he's he's kind of an analytics guy, but he he worked with the Red Sox, who are kind of at the cutting edge of everything that's going on in the game. And he's believed to be one of the best and brightest minds coming through. He's, he's interviewed for countless jobs. So, Puffy. yeah. <laughs> You're going to put me in a box, aren't you? <laughs> so, uh, do, you, do you prefer him to Molitor? No, I don't have a preference because, honestly, I think even if you consider Mankiewicz still in the bit, and I'm not really sure that he is, No. they, they all bring something. But I do like Mankiewicz yeah, as a manager, They all bring something prospect. unique to the table that is going to be a fresh yeah, mafia, mindset. Mafia connection, yeah. that's my guess. But a, fresh, a breath of fresh air, whether it's analytics, whether it's instilling a work ethic in guys that maybe you didn't think you saw before. Sure. There will always there'll be something different from what was happening at Target Field in the Metronome the last 13, even 30 years when you considered the logical extension of Tom Kelly retiring and Gardenhire taking over. It's going to be different, and it might be a very good different, or it might be a different that's an adjustment period at first, but it's going to be different. Terry Ryan's very professional in how he handles things. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't give you much of a read on what he's going to do. Having said that, I'm going to ask you to take a complete and total guess. Do you think he's, he, he's 
to a point where he, he senses that Twins fans are sick of the same old, same old, and that if he stays in-house, if he stays in-organization, there might be a little revolt, and that's why he might be leaning Lavello. The trouble for me is a year ago, you wouldn't consider Molitor in-house because he was just a roving instructor. So right. in, in-house is such a, a, a cancerous term in this situation because you think of all the things that have gone wrong with this organization in the last four years, but you can't tie all those failures to one person specifically, no. especially not... Well, Bill Smith. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> especially not I'm Paul Molitor. Kidding. And so I think, though, there is a... a you, you have to wonder at what time do you look at what you've done the last four years and the, the results and say, this isn't working. Do something different right. rather than this This is what worked before. Well, right. what worked in 2002 isn't going to work in 2014. At some point, you have to alter your course and do something different. Now, when does that become your thought process? If it hasn't yet, I don't know if it ever will. That's the problem. You know, I, I don't know if we're at that point. Well, it, it, Paul Molitor, Paul, I, I, we talked to Jim Suhan on a regular basis. Of course, uh, that goes back to our 1,500 days as well. And he was on the show. Of, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hit you there. We could go Monday. And basically, he said the two most brilliant baseball minds that he's ever encountered are Tom Kelly and Paul Molitor. And, I mean, Paul Molitor is a guy who had a Hall of Fame career. When you see him, I mean, he, he's not an imposing athletic figure. I mean, don't get me wrong. He had wheels. I mean, he had... He, he, uh, he was a little injury prone. He was the uh, igniter. Yeah, but he, he, he's, he's one of these guys, and I, this is going to sound kind of flaky, but he's very bow-legged. And bow-legged guys, like, in terms of the athletic ability and, and, uh, and in pro sports, they're typically fast and, and, and injury prone. I mean, bow -legged, I mean, I'm just telling you. what. I mean, guys, if, you could, if, 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 a child, if, a, if a small child could walk through the man's legs without him taking anything but his normal <laughs> posture, chances are he's athletic, he can run a little bit, but he's going to be injury prone. That was Paul Mahler. But he wasn't 6'5", 225, scrapping. I mean, he was, he was a great player, partly because he had great wheels, uh, until he had too many injuries to have great wheels. But, but he, was a, he was a scientist. He, 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 he could read pitchers. He's as good a base runner, as professional. This is going to sound like it's trite, but it's not. He is as professional a base runner as, as this game has ever seen. I mean, he can go from first to third better than anybody. He can tag and, and, and get, get an extra base better than anybody. He can steal and read a pitcher, get, a, get the proper lead better than anybody. And he can teach that, too. For me, he's going to be, he would be. I won't say he's going to be because I don't know that he's going to be the guy. I think he would be a good mix of old school badass with new school approach. And I think he could meld those very creatively and be a guy who innovates but doesn't really screw with the old guard and you know how strong the old guard is at target field how many of those employees in that front office have been there 20 30 years and you you have to be able to send shock waves through that organization without ruffling feathers in a way that's going to you know get you on the outs i think he could be that kind of guy now everybody wants to bring in joe madden pay him x millions of dollars yeah. to make him the highest paid manager I think you've got a guy in Molitor who could do the same kind of thing and has the same kind of mind. Everybody says, well, why isn't he a manager yet? Mm -hmm. I, I think he's got a young child. I think he's got, you know, he's got a younger family besides that he probably wouldn't want to be away from. I don't, I don't think the managerial job was right for him, uh, aside from when he applied back when they hired Guardy. The, the time between, I don't think it's been right for him to be a manager. I think the time is right right now, and I think he'd be a good fit. Yeah, I, and he's, he's not a young guy. I mean, it's getting to the point where he's got to get a job or, or just, it's just not going to happen. Well, and that's, what about him as new school? I mean, he is, he is rather old. He, St statistically, analytically, and, and the, the cutting-edge trends of the game, we've, we've been told, whether it's as media or as fans, that he's a big believer in the shifts okay. and the, the newer school thoughts with on-base percentage and that kind of thing. I think... It may not even be necessarily new school, but actually just getting what he's seeing on the field and then digesting it and then turning it around and using it for a team. Maybe not necessarily new school, but uh, on the edge of the way things are going. Now, Lavello is a, he's a bench coach in Boston, correct? Yeah. Give the folks uh, his background as a, as a manager. I know he was, a, I believe, a, an A-ball and a double-A manager about 10 years ago. Won awards at both levels for, like, manager of the year. Uh, he played... Uh, he was kind of a utility infielder for, I think, like the Angels and a bunch of other teams in the early mid-90s, late 80s. So the, a lot of people believe you can't be a great player and be a great teacher. We saw it with Ted Williams when he was a manager. Mm -hmm. Horrible manager. <laughs> yeah, horrible managers, great players. So there, there is some semblance of worry with, with Molitor that will be like that, where Lavello, not a great player, but maybe a good teacher. I, I don't think it's going to make any difference. I think Lavello's got a good acumen. I think he's got a good uh, base around him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's worked for the Red Sox. Again, that team is always at the cutting edge of where things are and where the pulse is in the game. Uh, with, uh, 
Uh, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, Joe, uh, Joe Madden, do you think they're going to reach out? Have they reached out? Is there any chance? I mean, it doesn't, he, it doesn't tell you. I don't think so. Why Can they think, not afford him? Or? Why do you think he told? Yeah, well, that's that's part of it. I mean, he declared himself a free agent manager. How, why, why did he do that? Why did he opt out? He had a, I think he had a clause in his contract where if Friedman left, he could too. And so when I farted. I'm sorry. <laughs> when the GM decided he was. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, when he, no when he one needed to know that. Yeah. Sorry, we keep it right. I don't think the listeners can tell. No, they might. But anyway, well, continue. continue. If we both so, pass out. Yeah, it depends. So when Friedman departed, he had a clause that triggered that he could leave too. And I think it was just, it's not going to get any better in Tampa. And it was pretty bad this year in Tampa. They weren't particularly right. good. They struggled. They right. had really good pitching, but they couldn't hit. I think he just decided, look, I'm, uh, I'm 60, I think he's 60 years old. It's time to see what my value is on the open market. I think he's going to go to the Cubs and make a whole lot of money. Brandon Warren is the guest. Jason McGovern is the producer slash sidekick. I'm Jeff Dubay. It's the Jeff Dubay Podcast live from Devil's Advocate, which has been our home from the very beginning. Uh, you can check us out Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays at 5 o'clock. Come on in for great happy hour specials. Come on in here and uh, and check in on social media and get a buck off of Widowmaker. Uh, and also, if you're here during the show, you can get a buck off the Widowmaker or the... the, the Crazy Mountain Crazy Pale Mountain, Ale. Crazy Mountain Pale Ale. Why can't I ever remember Crazy Mountain Pale Ale? Uh, but I can't, so I just, I'm just going to have to deal That's with it. That's what I'm here for. Uh, so, and, and I would also like to point out that uh, the Jeff Dubay Show is not a standalone. We are a part of a network. It is called the Alive and Social Network, and it features a couple other programs, one being the Wednesday night live music showcase. Every Wednesday night, the live music showcase uh, uh, takes place from Shamrock's Pub, St. Paul. They feature the, the Last Ride Band as the host, and they feature guest artists every week. Check them out on Spreaker. They're also on the Alive and Social Network. Follow them on Twitter at the Last Ride Band. The Last Ride Band. I was there last week. You were there last I week. I was there, yeah. It was fun. And they had the dude from The Voice. One of the dudes from yeah. The Voice. What was his name again? I don't remember. I don't Why do you put me handsome, on the spot like that? Handsome guy. Yeah. Good, well, good there looking, you go. Good not, afraid, guy. not afraid to admit it. Not afraid to admit it. Handsome guy. <laughs> Uh, but it's some dude from The Voice. Uh, anyway, I don't watch The Voice, so I don't know. I don't watch reality TV I watched, at all. I watched one season of The Voice, like two years ago, because the girl I've seen at the time totally dug The Voice. I had to watch That's every That's the only Monday, way a guy should watch every The Voice. Every Monday, I had to watch The Voice and Dancing with the Stars, but I got laid like crazy. So, I mean, you, Worth it. you do what you got to do. It. Do what you got to do. I'm not going to name names. No, don't worry about it. Uh, anyway, the other show that I want to mention, uh, well, there's two others. I want to mention the Pubecast, which starts, oh, I'm sorry, the Pubcast. Thank you. The Pubcast, which starts... Uh, God, the Thursday after, night. The day after tomorrow. Are you yeah. ready? Uh, you don't no. Look, you don't we have ready. zero prepped. Uh, uh -oh. No idea what we're going to talk oh, about. That's a bad promo. Sounds like we're just going to bullshit for an hour. I don't know. No. Uh, a, O'Gara's 5 to 6 Thursday. Love uh, O'Gara's. Love Danny. Hi, Danny. Molly Burke and myself are going to talk. What We're going to shoot the shit in a pub. That, that's basically what the show is. We're going to talk good. about Thanks everything you would in a pub. Uh, and it's so not going to be like this. A, It'll be a Burke and a McGovern. A Burke and a McGovern in an Irish pub. That's yes. just shocking. Yeah, I mean, you're, yeah, you're, and Speed and Molly, as you like oh, to call them too, <laughs> which is a yeah. His nickname uh, is Speed, isn't that dicey? Right? That whole thing writes itself. I mean, you maybe don't even have to have any material. It'll just you almost don't. You just open you your mouth don't. and it'll come out. But we've got plenty to talk about this Thursday. Come on down. Yeah, and uh, one other thing to mention: the Rusty Gaten B Review. It's on. You can check it out on iTunes or on Spreaker. Uh, go to, to this is one word: the Rusty Gaten B Review dot com. Rusty, of course. If anybody doesn't know, you should. He's on KSTP for. 30 years? Yeah, 30 how years. Do you not know, right? I, I, I mean, he's, he's, been, he's been a, a local television fixture uh, as an entertainment reporter, traffic reporter. We work with him at Hubbard. We all know him from Hubbard. Uh, and now he's part of the Alive and Social Network. You can find him on Twitter. So this is all part of the uh, of the Alive and Social Network, which I'm, well, it's like say I'm a part of it, but I'm not a part of it. I am pretty much it. I mean, it's, let's face it. I'm I thought I know you were going I'm the, there. I'm the bell cow. I am I'm the, the Alive and Social I'm Network. I'm the bell cow. I mean, I, come on. I'm at the big your head's small. I'm the, I'm the Sergeant Hoka. I'm, <clears throat> I'm the big toe of the Alive and Social Network. Hey, yeah, you, no, I you, will, again, Brandon, too young to get the Sergeant Hulka reference. I will, I will hang on your coattails, though, no problem. So, they hand uh, you the so football. It's, it's nice to be the Dambrero of a place once in a while. <laughs> I know that won't last because we'll add shows and Rusty will get big and I'll turn back. Well, no, what are you going to do when I'll we get 20,000 downloads and you're still at 19? I know, I'll turn into the common man. I'll go from <laughs> Brewer to the common man. Whatever. Hey, that doesn't sound like a bad place to I'm, be in life either. Well, yeah, yeah, it's not bad. It's not bad at all. I'll be, I'll be, but for now, I am the suture of the alive and the social. Hey, so, so suck it, guys. That'll do. That'll do. Back, Back to baseball. World Series. How cool is it? Yeah, speaking of our ace. Well, you know what? Let's let's the, the world, the, the the Kansas City Royals. I I've really been torn on this. I mean, it's great. I know it's great. And Ryan Lefevre is the voice of the Kansas City Royals, and he was he was my one of my groomsmen and pseudo best man for my wedding uh, a number of years ago. So I'm happy for him, and I'm happy that they're having success. But at the same time, the Royals. I mean, when we suck, which has been for the last you know four years or whatever, three four years. The Royals were the one team that you'd like to measure yourself against. Like, come on, let's finish ahead of the Royals. Let's put, make a push and finish ahead of the Royals. And now they're in a goddamn World Series. And it's, so it's, it's, it's cool, it's cute, it's a nice little story. But it's also like, wow, we suck. 
I mean, it, that was my that was my measuring stick. The Royals were my measuring stick. Yeah, it gives you a sense of just how far the Twins are from relevance. And yes, thank it's, you. It's that good was a much pitching. better way to put it. <laughs> it's, it's good pitching. It's great defense. It's hitting when you need it. It's maybe not, you know, they don't have the the, the Yankees offense of a few years ago. Or they even don't the have Tigers. a very good manager, I don't think. I think Yost is a goofball. Yeah, Yost, Yost ma- marches to the beat of his own drummer, and boy, is it weird. Yeah. But... It, he's pushing the buttons somehow. Yeah, yeah. That it is, is where, it doesn't make any sense to anybody who's breaking the games down. Right. But at the same time, you know they're within two games of winning the World Series. Now their backs are against the wall going back home. Thank you, Glenn Perkins, for having yes, the American correct. League hosting. So it, well think done. about if, if, if the Twins were in the World Series tonight would be Game Six here at Target Field. That'd be chilly. Yeah, that would oh, be really that would darn be. cold. It was like 39 degrees. There were flurries. Hey, what, is, what the hell is Keith Olbermann talking about the Gophers and the Vikings in the same sentence for? What is going on? Yes, said, uh, oh, that can't be good. That, that can't be good. I mean, He's, here, here, here at uh, Devil's Advocate, they've got a TV on. What the uh, what show is Keith Olbermann on? It's uh, his show. He's got his own show. It's called Olbermann. It's on ESPN. And he just he was just talking about the Gophers. He had a big graphic with the Vikings and the Gophers in the same graphic. The last time he talked about Minnesota sports, I think, was the Twins and their, uh, their, what was it, their... Uh, <laughs> oh, here they, it is, because there's going to be a protest because the Redskins are coming to town. And we're going to get to that, too. Oh, we're yes, going to get to that, too. Right. Yes. And, then, and we're going to get to a, a Facebook post that I wrote. We did, it's going to be my new bit, read my Facebook stuff hey, on air. Well, this is all about social media. So well, yeah, exactly. I mean, right over, the, over the weekend, I, I spent the time to, to, to craft a couple of lengthy pieces. One was about uh, Native American nicknames. I almost said African American nicknames. We are, are not. A lot of those? We are not in favor of African American nicknames in any way, shape, or form. But this way to what, take a stance, dude. <laughs> way to take a stance. Well, like all those brave people who took a stance against child abuse when when Peter <laughs> the Peterson struck him out. Way to go out on a limb, Chris Carter. Way to be a man. But uh, uh, the Native American nicknames in sports. I wrote something about that, and then the next day I wrote something about Glenn Mason and uh, and Jerry Kill, which was on yesterday's show. If you haven't heard yesterday's show. What the fuck's wrong with you? But don't go back and listen to yesterday's show. But we'll get into uh, Native American nicknames here shortly. But uh, the, the, the Royals, my take on the Royals, uh, you know, watching them, the, the run they were on, I don't think I've ever seen it. Have you seen a run like that, Brandon? I mean, the, the, the way they came from behind in the one-game playoff, in the wild-card game, I guess is what, what technically it would be called, and then, and then to just steamroll through a, a really good Angels team, probably the best team in baseball on paper, uh, and, and, and just to, 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 to play baseball at such a dominant level, I mean, and I'm missing a series in there. What is with the the, the Orioles? The, the Orioles too. I mean, they, they just they just absolutely hot knife through butter. Whatever insert favorite cliche here. I mean, it was it was such an influential run where nothing could stop them. I I, I thought to myself as the world. I didn't think to myself. I said it on the show. As the World Series started, I said as soon as they lose a game, that bubble might burst. And I think I, I was wrong about that. But I think the way they lost Game Four is where the bubble burst. They were up four to four to two. Correct. It might even been. Four. Bigger than that, but they they just well, from gave that point on just blew up. From that point on, they've been outscored like fourteen to nothing. I mean, they gave up a bunch of runs that game, and then they lost five nothing last night. Now I know Baumgartner is the bomb. He does put the bomb in. He's Baumgartner. nasty. And, and 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 now they're going home. But I, I you know what? I honestly think that San Francisco is going to win Game Six, like eight to one. Who pitches I really, I really do. Who, PV, what's the matchup? It's PV and Jordano Ventura, so the young guy. Well, if you're a the baseball fan, tour. watch tonight because you're not going to see another game for and months. PV, you better watch tonight. PV is nails. I want to see a game seven. Mid thirties guy that too. went from maybe be low thirties, but flamethrower to like one of the most crafty righties. He, he's just awesome. Yeah, yeah. and he, he, it's pitching poetry. Now you're, you talk about the Royals. You, you hate the cliches, but it was a team of destiny until, like yes. you said, they lost. They that the comeback in that game against the A's was just storybook, and then you know, rolling the ball down third baseline, scoring that run. Blasting through Buck Showalter's O's, and Buck Showalter starting to become a manager where people don't think can win the big one. Right. And you, you just, just got the sense that it was a team that was peaking at the right time. You see teams go on runs like this, like the Twins in ninety. Was I, it called, I called the Royals a team of destiny. But yes, the Twins in ninety one. When they won, what did they win? Like fourteen straight, fifteen straight, seventeen straight. Oh, at the beginning of the season. Yeah. Yes. The, yes. Yes. And it was actually ended by the Orioles. But the, run, the runs that when you when you plan to go on, you don't. Everything plan, goes right. Everything when you goes go on right. a run like that. Yeah. The best time it can come is late September into October, and the, yep. the Royals did exactly. And there was talks at the trade deadline, oh, you guys should think about trading James Shields. You can't sign him. You're not going to make the playoffs. You look at the A's. But they traded Will Myers for him, for God's sake. Right. I mean, but, but you look at the A's bringing in all that pitching. You look at the Tigers bringing in David Price, and you're thinking, nobody else in the AL has a shot. No. Both of those no. teams are sitting home watching yeah. the championship series, not the World Series, the championship done series. In, done in their first round each. Right. Both I mean, gone. Just gone. So Instantly. The, the, for, the fortitude and the foresight, if you want to call it that, of the Royals to stay the course when things look down, it's fantastic. It's unbelievable. Everything about this team defies convention. 
Yeah, oh, I agree. In I, every way, every every way you can imagine. When the when the World Series started, were you thinking if they lose a game, they're going to just tank, or did you did you have more belief in them? I thought once they lost a game, the bubble would burst, and they lost a game and came back trailing in Game Two. And, and I thought, but boy, I was right about this. And all of a sudden, they, they win game two, win game three, and we're in position to win game four. There's that, there's that even year magic for the Giants, too. That, you know, again, you hate those cliches, but the Giants have won the World Series in 2010, 2012, and then right here again in 2014. And there were another team that was just kind of floundering. Tim Lincecum threw a no-hitter, mm -hmm. and things just kind of started turning around. So it's two teams that you wouldn't call the best most talented teams in either division or either league because yeah. Mike Trout and the Angels were fantastic this year in the National League. The Nationals were ridiculous. Well, weren't the Dodgers? And the Dodgers were, were unbelievable, were the spending yeah. crazy yeah. money on people, and then their pitchers started getting hurt. And at, well, you know they had Kershaw, and they had Granke, and they had nobody. The Kevin Correa got traded there for crying out loud. That's how bad Jeez. they needed pitching. So Is Pablo Sandoval becoming the Reggie Jackson of our era. It's unbelievable what that guy does. He's in October. so fun to watch, and he's going to get paid this off season. He's yeah, and I just like to see fat guys succeed. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like it's like score it's one like, for, for the myself. good guys. Score yeah, one for the good guys. Yeah, give me some the, up top. He is fat the guys. fastest fat, fat guy. guy in the world, though. Seriously, like, um, he, I mean, uh, nah, quick, quick, I'll line up with him. Sorry, no, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. No, you're, you're, no, you're right. But his, his quick hands, he's made two crazy yeah, plays oh, in the last yeah. couple games on crazy bounces that no one should have even caught. He's a Hoover over there. Made the play. He's a Hoover. Yeah, yeah. It's a vacuum cleaner. He sucks everything up. Picks everything. And he's only a clutch hitter. I mean, he's just. Such a, so but, clutch. But what the hell's wrong with Hunter Pence? Can somebody just take him aside and say, why are you such a douche? You I mean, mean the practice swing or what he does in the batter's the box, box yeah. or his hair? How about, how about the fact or... that your pants are above your knees? <laughs> you, your pants cannot be shorts. Up. I yeah. mean, if you want to be old school and wear high pants in baseball, that's okay, I guess. It's a little weird, but I can, I I can respect that, But not above the knee. No. You cannot have the pants above the knee ever in baseball. There's so ever. many. There's so many cookie cutter guys, though, that don't show any emotion. Oh, he's Hunter a douche. Pence. Don't give him credit. He's, <laughs> a he's fun. I think he's fun. He's a fucking douche. <laughs> He, he, no, he, you gotta say he does make baseball. Oh, fun. I, I will say. Oh, that. Here's, a, here's what infuriated me the other day. In their big <laughs> inning, and, and I'm not. This is not a Hunter Pence rant. This is a rant against. Was it who's the who's the pitcher? Was it Hernandez, the big hard throwing uh, uh, Latin American pitcher that the, the Royals played? Yeah, hundred. You're down over, or Kelvin Herrera. 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 Yes, yes. I mean, so so Hunter Pence is up, and Herrera throws two fastballs. Where I'm convinced that Pence in going 0 2 has soiled himself. Yeah. I mean, I'm convinced <laughs> that he is not only in an 0-2 hole, but that he has absolutely crapped the pants. I mean, he's, he can't even believe how hard this guy's throwing. And at 0-2, what does he do? He throws a breaking ball that a contact hitter can reach out and just kind of flick the wrist and, 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 and pull into the hole in left field. I'm just like, are you insane? You just threw two fastballs to this idiot who doesn't have a prayer against either of them. You've got him 0-2, and if you throw him something letter high, he's going he's gonna to flail and go sit down. You're throwing light speed, and, you're, and you and, just and, slow it down. And it's one thing, <clears throat> excuse me, if this, if this guy's a dead red, you know, power hitter who just sits on a fastball like an Adam Dunn, right. be careful. But he's not. He's a little, he's a truck up on the bat, slap, punch and Judy, give me something off speed or something breaking that I can adjust to and just, and just wuss hit into, that I can junior Ortiz into right field or something. And, and, and sure enough, 0-2, here comes the breaking ball, and here comes Hunter Pence with, with a brilliant adjustment to it. I mean, you saw him just, I mean, you see his head just lock in. He, 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 you can see the slider, you can see a, sl a slider spin. I mean, players really do read that. It's a red dot right in the yep. middle of the ball. So they, they read the slider spin, and his head locks into it. He drops his left shoulder, and because his lead shoulder, because he knows his ball's dipping, and he's just on top of it. I mean, he didn't hit the hell out of it, but he pulled it through the hole and, and, and got a base hit after two fastballs made him look like he was uh, me. I mean, seriously. Well, there's something about he goes up there and hacks on the first pitch and the second pitch, and then once he gets to 0-2, now he's playing for contact, and it's almost he becomes a much better hitter, and he's hitting something like 600 yeah. when he's 0-2, yeah. which is a crazy well, he's, stat. He's he's a great contact guy. And if you're going to throw him off speed or breaking stuff, he'll adjust. I just cannot stand pitchers who overmatch guys with heat and think, okay, now I'm going to get cute. Now I'm ahead. Now they I can get their own heads. Him. Yeah, I mean, he. Well, how he much is that as a catcher, hit. though, too? I mean, it's uh, the guy calling the game. Well, yeah, I guess. You can tell him no. But, well, no, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, mean yeah, I mean, the pitcher the pitcher has the final say. I, I mean, he'll, he'll shake you off. But if he shakes you off enough, you want to go out and talk to him. But if you've got a guy 0-2 and he doesn't have a prayer against your fastball, don't speed up his bat. Don't throw him something that's going to make him look better than he is because Hunter Pence could not hit that fastball, and he wasn't going to hit that fastball. Especially that, on the next pitch. Oh, God, was that ridiculous. Was that, did, you, did that make you mad watching yeah, it? I, was, I, mean, I was furious at how stupid it was. You get in your own head sometimes and you think that there's a, a path that you have to follow to get guys out. Sometimes it's as easy as 
overmatch the guy. You know what the best 0-2 pitch is in baseball? It is a shoulder-high fastball because yep. very few people can lay off it, and literally nobody can hit it. Maybe Cabrera. I mean, I'm not sure there's a pitch that Cabrera can't hit. Or old-school Vladdy Guerrero. Yeah, Guerrero Kirby maybe. Puckett. I mean, when I see Puckett, I saw Puckett flail at a lot of chin-high fastballs. I mean, it's a hard pitch to lay off of because it's it's a four-seamer. That's not, it's not, you don't want it to sink. So it's a four-seamer. It's a heavy fastball. It's not going to move. It looks and it's, so good. And it's right down Broadway. I mean, it is, it is over the middle six inches of the plate every time. It's, it's meant to be because it's meant to look tantalizing. It's meant to come in with no movement. It's meant to look like I'm going to hit the shit out of this. But guess what? It is. It is. It, it is. It is shoulder high, and you've got to you've got to start it early. If you don't start it early, you're not going to catch up to it, and you're not going to lay off of it. And it is so good that you might have an erection by the time it gets to home plate. <laughs> I mean, it is. It is so beautiful, but you can't lay off it, and you can't hit it. It's it, the, the best O2 pitch in baseball is climb the ladder. Just don't make the mistake of letting it drift below the letters. If if, if, if you drift it below the letters, people are going to hit it. It's gone. Yep. But I mean, the, the margin for error. I mean, if it's if it's if it's if it's letters, it's gone. If it's shoulders, it's a strike. And there's I mean, a swing and a miss. And there's no in between. Well, in O2, it should also be on the ground. It should be in the dirt, otherwise, too, right? Well, I mean, as long as you aren't anybody on base, you don't want to throw something in yeah, the dirt with yeah, people on base. True. But I, I mean, yeah, you can waste you can waste a slider in the dirt O2 or change up in the dirt if there's nobody on. But just I mean, to show I, I it. love yeah, just I, show it. I love to climb the ladder with two strikes. I mean, I love to see that. And it just, just, you can't, it's the hardest pitch in baseball to not swing at. And I don't think it's done as much anymore as it no. used to be. I think that's a, a very 80s, 90s thing when pitchers were a little bit wired just a little bit because not everybody was throwing 95, 96, 98. They were still 92, 93, and you had to innovate a little bit. And, and 93 up there looks a lot faster. Yeah, Brandon Warren, great baseball mind, is the guest. Uh, we're talking uh, World Series, we're talking Twins manager. Uh, we are 45 minutes past the uh, top of the hour, so we got about 15 minutes left in the show. Try to explain to people in, in, in very plain English what metrics are. So, like saber metrics? Yes, I don't mean like a meter or a centimeter so, or a kilogram. I, I mean, we're talking <laughs> a, a, a new age statistical analysis of baseball. Basically, really. trying to dig deeper than just your, your average stats to, to show you what's going on, not only on the surface level, but, but on stats that nobody's heard of. Underlying level, yeah. yeah. And so, the, it's, it's mathematical, it's, it's calculus in some instances, it's, it's very deep, heady stuff, and there's a significant amount of noise in it. I will give you that. There are certain statistics that come around that they, they hang around for a while, yep. and then eventually they say, yeah, you know, we're not going to use this one. I mean, throw it away. Give us some give us some of the most popular, most respected sabermetric measurements, such as war, and then tell people what each one means. I think war, which is wins above replacement, which basically tells you how much better a guy is than a replacement And level. this is something that the A's use religiously, war. I yeah. mean, it doesn't really be, rely heavily on war. I, think I the, mean, he lets people go based on, 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 on what we will lose ba- uh, you know, based on what we have behind that guy. I think it's, they, they do more proprietary stuff, but it's all based on the same general idea that if you have a guy who's undervalued but can provide that value at a cheaper cost, mm-hmm. the, basically the, the crux of Moneyball was finding market inefficiencies, which was what does baseball not value right now that we can get on the cheap, whether it's on-base percentage, ground ball pitchers, fly ball pitchers if I have a really good outfield defense, and that is the and case a big ballpark. with the Royals. The Royals have the best outfield defense in the game today, bar none. And guys a big ballpark, like, right? Yep, and guys like Jason Vargas have been fantastic. Jeremy Guthrie, fantastic. Giordano Ventura, who throws a lot of fastballs, but also gets fly balls. So it's it's finding things in the league that are under appreciated. Now, on base percentage is huge now because mm-hmm. everybody knows you got to get on base to score, and that's why guys like Joe Maurer are considered good baseball players. Sure. Now, these metrics like war have come under fire a little bit because we're not really sure. Which is wins above replacement. Right. Which is what you're talking about. How to deal with defense. Defense has been so hard to quantify. It is. It is. And they're working with new things. There's a belief that there's a thing called field effects that teams have, and it might might even be real, Mm -hmm. where they can quantify how guys move and and based on positioning and where they end up. So it's kind of like a wide receiver's catch radius. Basically, like, yeah. Well, what's the guy's range? It's, 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 it used to be so simple. It used to be that they give a guy a plus or a minus for range. Yeah. But, but that's, that's, that doesn't cover it. There's more than two categories for, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Well, when you look at fielding percentage, that only counts the balls you can get to. Correct. So if you've got a statue at shortstop, he might make 10 errors all season long, but he might miss 50 balls that a guy who makes mm-hmm. 25 errors Correct. can get to. You, you, you know, your Pedro Florimones might get to that ball, whereas your Derek Jeters might not. Yep. So it's, it, we're, we're kind of in a transition period where we thought war was a lot better than it was. And now war is kind of like, it's a guideline, but it's not as black and white as we once maybe were led to believe, or a lot of people in the mainstream thought it was. Now, it's, it's just basically trying to con- figure out a player's value, and, and if you were to subtract them, how much your team would stand to lose by replacing them with someone from AAA, your, your run-of-the-mill AAA player, and uh, you know, you've got weighted on-base average, which basically is like 
taking all the hits, putting them together, and then scaling it to on-base percentage. And then you can see how a guy is versus like league average at his position, and just kind of use all these. So it's, it's just taking the next step with these stats, and, and a lot of it ends up being. I believe in some of it, not all of it. Really heady, and I think you got to pick and choose. There's a certain. Le- it's just like in life, where there's a certain level of skepticism that should come with anything you're ever told. Yeah. Because you should always have that safe amount of doubt that somebody. Oh, may I still refuse to look both ways before I cross the street. Which way, which way do you look? I look each way once, and then I'm gone, baby. <laughs> Boom. Boom. I don't have time for that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Never look back. <laughs> That's exactly. But hey, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead and finish your thought. Oh, no. It's just so... so it, but hurry the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And so, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a certain amount of doubt that every, anything that you're told... So you use those numbers. When you watch a game, maybe you think you see something, so you go look at the numbers. Do the numbers say something else? Yep. Well, what are you missing? Do the numbers say something completely different? Well, then are you, are you an idiot? You know? <laughs> it always makes you wonder. We're down to about 10 minutes left in the show. Did you did you want to do the Grillo host bit or not? I do have a couple things. Okay, okay, we'll throw a couple out there. We'll see if we can kill some time. So I, you know, we, we worked concurrently at 1500, and I think yes. we both had good experiences in, in some respects. You're, maybe you're very rarely in studio, though, so I didn't see you very often. Almost never. Oh, is it ballpark? Yeah, I was, never, I, was, I was never actually on the air, and that was actually a part that I was kind of bummed out about was I spent the whole year with the, with the station. And we should I, have had you on. And Why didn't like, we have you on? And oh, we're like, big. Judd and I were, we were big time, and everybody. So they'll be like, "Oh, we got this beat reporter and this repeat reporter," and I'm just like, "You know, you got a beat reporter. I could be on there too." Yeah, so we should have. You should have brought it up. But I just want to know what, how how was your if if you were to do an exit interview, what were your thoughts of working at 1500? Uh, I, th- I it was it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. I mean, I, I like the bosses. You know, Brad and Dan, Bradley and Dan Seaman. I mean, I've known Dan forever, and working with Judd was phenomenal because he's a workaholic. I mean, if you're going to work with somebody, work with somebody who's going to do most of the work. I mean, it's just, it's a, you know, I'm not kidding. I mean, I'd get there at 730. I mean, I was not taking buses. from I was living uptown. I was taking buses over there. Wait for that goddamn green line to open. Of course, it never did, but I got fired before the green line opened. Um, and, and now it's just running into people left and right. By the way, if you get hit by a train, you fucking deserve it. Don't more be hits than the how twins this year. How do you see that? Seriously, how do you not see a train coming? Are you that stupid? The light rail had, had more hits than the twins this if year. If you get hit by a train, Jesus. we are all we're doing is thinning the gene pool, thin the herd. It's because sad, you're an it's idiot. True. If you don't see a train coming, then we don't need you. And this is coming from the guy who doesn't look across the street both times. So well, I look, look once. Twice. I look once, and I'm gone. Yeah. And uh, that includes trains. But uh, anyway. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would get there around 7.30. And would, I would get there by 7.30, and Judd would already be on a second cup of cop- coffee, would have taken a dump, and have the show put together. I mean, he, he is the most efficient workaholic, and, and he had, like, this detailed outline of the show. And it was, for me, it was just paint by numbers at that point. So, I mean, he – talk about a perfect guy to work with because he was, like, type A, and I'm more of the uh, left brain, believe it or not, kind of guy who just wants to, you know, take it as it goes and be spontaneous. And, uh, and he's like he's he's like like a type personality, you know, right side of the brain. Everything's in order. Everything's logical. Everything's set up perfectly. So it was it was it was, it was absolutely perfect for me. But uh, I, one thing that I always caught me off guard is when I worked at Clear Channel for so long, and Clear Channel's got the uh, reputation of you know the big evil, cold-hearted uh, you know corporation. I mean, and it is. It's not a warm fuzzy. <laughs> I mean, Clear Channel's not you know give you a hug kind of a place. But everybody always said, what you want to do is you want to get over to Hubbard. It's family, and it's, it's, it's just easier going, and it's, it's this, it's that. It's, it's, it's nice and friendly. And, and it was friendly, but at Clear Channel, I'm watching people bust their ass. To success. I mean, I'm watching salespeople and promotions people just going 100 miles an hour every day to make sure everything, every little detail is covered. You know, like you got a ton of commercials. You're, just, every show's oversold. I mean, you, they, they, they're, just, they're ringing every dime of revenue they can out of everything. And then I get over to Hubbard, and... People are stretching and yawning and <laughs> leaning. And a little more relaxed. Oh, I mean, nobody's working. <laughs> I mean, did that, did, we had shows that had no commercials. I mean, I, I like I had like full endorsement load the whole time I was at KFAM for ten years. I mean, I would do like five endorsements at a time. I'd be pimping AT and T or Slim Genix or, uh, or, 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 or or a car dealership or whatever. I mean, I'd have like all the like, Purina, Purina one dog food. I mean, just just turning these out. And I was at, uh, at at Hubbard for a year, and I never even had an endorsement opportunity, p- like like even pitched to me. I mean, nobody even attempted even. I mean, none, not once the whole year. Uh, and it's like, does anybody? I mean, there was there's there's a sales guy there named Rob O'Brien who busts his ass. He does a great job. We just call him Moby, and uh, Robbo, and uh, he he is he could work at Clear Channel. I mean, he could he could he could be a difference maker at Clear Channel. I'm not sure anybody else there could get a job at Clear Channel. I mean, in terms of the salespeople that I was that I was around. I mean, it was a slow moving crew. I mean, it really was. You ever walk through that that office, the sales office? Oh, it's sleepy. It's, it's sleepy. Relaxed. I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it, you you could wake people up if you're not careful. It's it's, it, it's just <laughs> and, and so when I found out when I was let go because they had revenue issues, 
I'm like, well, yeah, because nobody sold a goddamn thing in the year I was there. But it was, it was I, I, my, in terms of the people I worked with, and, and, and like I saw, you know, Dan and, and, and Brad, you know, dancing with Brad Lane and Judd, and, and you know, Tony Lee and all the people like you bump into on a daily basis. But Dave Harrigan, I gotta mention Harrigan. Harrigan's awesome, best producer I've ever had. No, I'm just kidding. What a say. dick. You know, no, but Harrigan's awesome. I mean, I knew Harrigan from the fan years. And uh, Dana Wessel was there when I started. And I knew him for the fan years. Yeah. So I mean, I, 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 my day-to-day -day existence at Hubbard was fantastic. I mean, I had a blast every day. I mean, the shows were fun. The, uh, the, the, the work. I mean, we did four hours. So I mean, the workload wasn't minimal. But again, Judd did the heavy lifting. I just, I was just there having a good time. And the, the people were cool. The, the work was cool. I just wish the operation was a little more efficient and made some money. That's, that's my complaint. I got two more. All right. Uh, so we got how many minutes? We got five minutes. We got five minutes. We're good. So this, I want this to be open ended because I think you'll give yeah. a better answer if I don't put you into a box here. Uh, on a scale of one to one hundred, how much do you miss? And this can be at any point the way it was, the way it was for you, at any point in history. How much do you miss it? I'm going to say 90. I can't say 100 because, I mean, I had it pretty good. I was making good money, and I love working with Paul. Paul's a, Paul's a friend of mine, and, and I, he's a guy that I love. And uh, the way a man can love another man, all right, without being, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that. But, I mean, he, he's somebody I'll always love and respect. He's somebody I loved working with. And, uh, and we were having fun. Every day was a blast. I mean, every day was a party. I mean, it was not even work for us. It was just, we, we were just such a perfect match together. That was just a blast. And it was easy, and... We had great ratings. It was, it was nice having great ratings because you felt like a rock star. I mean, like, people protected you. Like, like, right now, I'm a little hoarse. Can you tell I'm a little hoarse? Yeah. I just drank, like, 10 Diet Cokes. But if I was on the air right now, like, my bosses would come in and treat me like I'm Adele. I mean, they, 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 they'd, <laughs> they'd, like, send me home and, like, tell me to drink some honey. And I mean, they treat me like I'm on the DL. Like, I had a picture with a tender elbow. I mean, it would make you feel, like, special. It, it, it really it was kind of nice. But I say 90 and not 100 because, I mean, they're the, the things... I mean, I don't believe in fate, but I do believe that everything you do in life sends you in a different direction that changes what's going to happen to you in the future. And if I wouldn't have had the problems that I had, I wouldn't have. I mean, I've, I've spoken it. I've done some rewarding things. I mean, I'm not, not tooting my horn, but I've, I mean, I've, I've enjoyed going to schools and I've enjoyed going to treatment centers. And I've enjoyed, you know, one-on-one -on -one work with other people who struggle. I've made some good friends. I'm dating a girl right now that I would never have met if I would have, you know, stayed, you know, married and, 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 and whatever. I mean, so, I mean. There, there's, there's a handful of things in my life right now, including the possibility of being able to be my own boss for the next 20 years, doing this, and making a reasonable living at it. I mean, so, I mean, I can't say 100. As good as things were, I mean, I, I mean things are good. I mean, I, I owned two homes. I was in a member of a country club, and I had a boat. I mean, things are pretty good. And I'll tell you one thing about boats. Women cannot keep their clothes on on a boat. <laughs> Even if you want them to, they will not keep their clothes on on a boat. So get a fucking boat, get a boat. <laughs> I'm telling you right now. You get a boat and you get a woman on the lake, and I, you might want her to get naked. You might not. She will get naked regardless. Women cannot keep their clothes on her boat. Just I just wanted you guys to both know that. So get a boat. That's good I'm gonna get a boat next year. I'm gonna boat. But I, I, I mean, so I, I had things good, but I mean, there's there's a handful of things in my life right now that I wouldn't have or wouldn't be experiencing, and, including the girl I'm seeing. And so I'm gonna just say that. I'm just say and you that. wouldn't have me as a producer. Well, that's I think not, that's probably yeah. right up there, right? I wouldn't have. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't know the folks at Devil's Advocate. I, no, okay, yeah, you too. <laughs> All one right. of my one of my favorite things when I was uh, we still have time for one more yeah just moving into the Twin you're Cities doing, you're doing great was the morning montage and I, I loved fun. that that was my favorite whether it was uh, you know meatloaf and they dubbed in the puffy now what I want to know it is where, so funny where did puffy come from okay that was a it was a it was a movie award show I don't know if it was the Academy Awards or the Golden Globes or it was just it was just a TV award show. It might have been there. I don't know, because something about Mary wouldn't have won an Oscar. I swear it was the MTV Music Awards. It might be or the MTV, MTV Movie Awards. It was it was it was it was Ben Stiller. I'm really losing my voice. Good thing the show's almost over. It was Ben Stiller on stage, uh, accepting an award for something about Mary. Can you remember the dog and something about Mary? It was named Puffy. Oh, okay. And he stepped up to the microphone and said, I wish Puffy could be here. He was talking about the dog that was in a cast, you know, because the, the, the joke was he jumped out a window in the movie. Uh, so anyway. Uh, the, uh, but he just, there was one sentence. He just stood there and he said, I mean, his speech was longer than one sentence, but the one sentence that lives in infamy is, I wish Puffy could be here. And then we just chopped Puffy out of there, which was Puffy. Or Puffy. I mean, it was, I w but I don't know why he said it like that. I wish Puffy could be, like he's got Tourette's or something. Yeah. I wish Puffy could be here, but that's how he said it. And Voice it, of modulation. Yeah, so it was, it was Ben Stiller, and it was, it was just one line out of a, uh, an acceptance speech for the movie Something About Mary. And, and I had a great idea. You know, we always had really cool stuff at the State Fair, T-shirts and things of that nature. And I said uh, to, our, uh, to our promotions director at the time, Lisa Sanderson, she's awesome, just love her to death, uh, that, that we should get keychains 
you know, like you keychains, you push a button and it makes a fart noise or something. I wanted ones with fart noises, but I also wanted ones that like you push a button and it would go puffy, or one that goes in your face, Milwaukee. Or I mean, you could take yeah. any of our any favorite of those drops. Uh, I used to play how about with a beer? those. Yeah, I love that one. How about a beer? I used that, to that, play with those all the time. One? Those those soundboards were the best. Oh yeah, because they they put them on the internet. They put yeah. them online. But wouldn't it have been cool to have it on a keychain in your pocket? I mean, like I could, I would have been sitting. I mean, I went to countless uh, AA meetings uh, in my early recovery. And you know they're talking about like when they're giving the, like the opening speech about powerlessness and and, and, and you just you're, you're, you you got to give yourself up because you can't run your own life and you're you know you have your powerlessness against this or that. I would have just had my finger my uh, on the button going puffy puffy <laughs> in the back of the room. It would have been hilarious. It would you, you got to take the laugh even at an AA meeting. You got to exactly. take the laugh. But I, I, I wish I would have had that keychain. But it, it, it turned out to be not cost effective. Damn it! Because it would have been the greatest item ever. But. <laughs> I mean, you could have had the like, common man's, you know, sound effects, and, or yeah, or the, uh, the that 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 goofy organ music that he used to play to fill time. I mean, that would, oh, the intermission I that. music. I love oh, the intermission music. So good. You, you could, I mean, you could have had like one for every show where you just push the buttons. I, that would have been the best promotion Perfect. item ever. Are we done? Is we are getting show? there. Yep. Well, uh, yeah, we are. We're in the final minute of the show. We're in the final twenty seconds. Brandon, thanks for coming. Thank you. I tell you, you. what, we, we do a show called Wild Wednesday, and we got a big Wild Wednesday announcement coming up uh, tomorrow, but we're not going to spill the beans yet. But when the hockey season ends and Wild Wednesday is no more, I'm considering. Now, don't go home and get all excited about this. But I'm considering about doing a Twins Tuesday. And you are, you're in the running. You're in the running. You're absolutely in the running to be a part uh, of that show on a weekly basis. Excellent. If you'd be interested. Oh, yeah. All right, man. Well, we'll talk to you about that down the road. We're out of here. Uh, thanks to Jason McGovern. Uh, the operation guy, you can suck it for buying your, selling yourself out for 500 bucks.